Well, good afternoon and welcome to the 24th Annual Capital Conference. This is our virtual edition. Uh, we're very glad that you're here today and welcome. And uh, we're uh, glad to have as our presenter for this session on computer science, our computer science contest, advanced contest strategies, Stacy Armstrong from Cypress Woods High School, who's uh, uh, one of our uh, veteran coaches, a uh, multiple time state champion uh, coach. And so we're, uh, we're glad that you're uh, here today, Stacy. Thank you for presenting for us and being willing to share your time and your knowledge and expertise with our attendees uh, at this year's Capital Conference. And I will turn it over to you. All right. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Everybody doing okay? You can just give me a thumbs up or whatever if you, if you got that. Okay, cool. David was nice enough to give me this fancy UIL background. So we match. We're like, it's like twin day when we've got the, uh, the same screen going. So that looks pretty cool. But uh, my objective today is just to go through some basic strategies with you, uh, show you some different sites online where you can do some practice. And if you've got questions, by all means, throw them in the chat and I'll stop and get to those and we'll kind of talk. So the session's design where I'm going to give you lots of info, but if you have questions about what we're talking about, there's no problem with me stopping and uh, kind of filling in some stuff as we go. So I'm going to switch over to my screen. Anyway, David introduced me, but I'll, I'll give you a little more background info as we, as we get started. But anyway, I'm going to switch over. I got some slides that are just going to kind of keep me on track because I have a habit of uh, kind of veering off whenever I get excited about stuff. So I might, might need a little uh, guidance with my slides so I can stay on track. All right, so everybody should see uh, my first slide with a couple pictures and that kind of stuff. Craig, can you see that? Give me a thumbs up if you got it. Everybody's good, okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so let, let's jump into this. I'm gonna run through some stuff. Like I say, if you've got questions, kind of slow me down, yell at me, and let me see where my, my chat is here. I'll try to pull that up so I can see that. There we go, I'll try to keep that up where I can see that too. that over here okay perfect all right so let's rock and roll so two, two, two. there we go so i'm stacy armstrong I, like i said david gave you a little bit of information on me uh, i've taught comp sci for 24 years i've taught all the way from intro cs all the way to data structures and i've done that the entire time i teach at Cy woods if you've been to any contests at all, you know, state UIL, local competitions, you will have heard my group screaming 212 during the award ceremony or any ceremony. My son started that tradition. He's in the bottom picture in the red shirt staring at the camera. He got to compete with us for four years. But our school motto is go the extra degree. Uh, water boils at, at 212, right? So we're supposed to go the extra degree to, to get to the point where the water boils. That's our, our, that's our school motto. So that's one of the big deals that we do when we go to competitions, try to keep things interesting and just make it a little more fun. All right, there we go. So this is my 22nd year coaching CS teams. Uh, I've been a part of the advisory committee for UIL for a long time, working with David. David seen me at competitions going all the way back. I think 2001 was my first trip to the state meet, which was a lot of fun. And then since then I've been back a few times and, brought back a few medals and a couple plaques here and there along the way but it's it's a cool journey it's a lot of fun definitely worth the time and commitment that it takes it takes to get that done as i said before my son sam he's participated in uh, uil academics for he did it for four years he just graduated and he's off at school getting a degree in computer science well, he's here now because of covid because he's <laughs> he spent the last i don't know six months of his uh college college time here hanging out with us which he'd rather be at school having more freedom but anyway you know it is what it is okay so here's what we're going to discuss today we're going to talk about recruiting trying to get kids excited get them involved the ways that you can do that uh, just some training approaches some stuff that i do with my students to try to get them ready to go and get them enough confidence that they want to go and then some strategies that we employ at the competitions and just some things that you can do with your students to help them build confidence and get more excited about the process and more prepared. And like I say, if at any point you need to stop me, just throw something in the chat. I'll pause for a second if you've got questions about what we need to talk about. One of the things you got to start with is you got to get the word out. You got to let kids know how much fun it is. 
You got to let them know they're going to learn more than they would have in their normal classes. They're going to make a bunch of friends, a bunch of buddies. I don't know how much fun it is to ride on the bus. You know, it's kind of overrated, I think, but some of them really enjoy getting on the bus and riding the bus on the weekend. Some of them don't, but it's kind of fun. I don't know if that's the best recruiting tool, but, but, it, but it might be. You might be able to sell it to them a little bit with the bus ride. One of the things that we do a lot of at Cy Woods and I've always done is I want them to realize that this is one big team. We're a big family. There's a lot of tradition involved. We want everybody to work together, everybody to kind of be on the same group. Obviously, there's going to be some people that do better than others, but we want everybody to be successful and have the confidence to go and do this, you know, as, as much as they have time to. Uh, TILF scholarships, that's another big thing that the kids can get excited about. That'll definitely get them fired up to make them understand that the process is, there's, there's other things involved in the process, other benefits other than just wanting stuff. As I said before, uh, you know, we create this team environment, this kind of family thing where we go and we compete. And when we go to the competitions, we try to yell and holler and make a bunch of noise and be as annoying as possible. But it, but it gets the kids excited. I mean, some of you guys from the Houston area that have been to competitions with us, I mean, Paul Stroud, we've interrupted his announcements at least every five minutes for the last four or five years since my son got involved. And so that's, that's, that's a fun thing to do. And it just gets the kids excited and fired up about the process. Announce results. When you get back to school and you have some success, you got to get on the announcements with it. You got to pub it up. You really got to make it a big deal. I'll go on the announcements with some of our, uh, some of our students that do our announcements each day and I'll get on there and scream and holler and throw a big fit and throw some two twelves out there just to kind of get the kids excited and let them know we appreciate all the time and effort that they're putting into the process to, you know, to win stuff and, and, you know, make the school look good too. All right. Training. Uh, I, I don't know what the approach is, but I'll go through, I'll go through what I do. We, we start our training program as soon as school starts, as soon as we can get kids in the room, obviously this year is going to be a little different. You know, we're not going to be able to do the after school face-to-face -face stuff that we normally do. We'll have to do some zoom sessions and some things like that. And it'll be obviously a little bit different, Did a lot of different, a lot of aspects. I'm going to talk about Yoda and Obi-Wan. I've got some cool Star Wars analogies that I think will, you'll find humorous. We work in groups. We do a lot of group stuff. We do a lot of peer tutoring. I'll go over some template stuff that you need to be aware of, and then we'll, we'll talk about practice problems and things like that. So basically the way I try to do this is I've got kids that have started with me, have worked with me for a lot of years that I've trained up and coached up, and I try to get my upper level advanced students to the point that they're comfortable working with my younger students. And so I have those guys do a lot of group sessions and one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And so basically I serve the role of Yoda and that's baby Yoda on the screen. If you've never seen the Mandalorian, then you're missing out because that's, that's good stuff. You know, if you've seen the Mandalorian, you know what I'm talking about, but if you haven't, you need to go check that out. Disney plus I'm not in any way paid or sponsored by Disney plus. I just think the Mandalorian is it's worth your time. If you haven't had a chance to see it but anyway, if you don't have uh, if you know, if you don't have the team to help you do the one-on-one, -on -one, the group stuff, then obviously you're gonna to have to serve the role of Yoda and Obi-Wan. But I prefer to be more of a Yoda role than, than Obi-Wan doing everything. Cause you can't do it all by yourself. I mean, it's very tricky to do that. I'll move, let me move my side around a little bit so I can see what I'm doing a little bit better. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, somebody had a question about a uh, tool for online contests. Uh, we use PC squared locally all the time. David would have to address the the other side of the equation, but for everything that we do in the Houston area, almost everybody runs PC squared for this year. Obviously that's not going to work. So I've talked to my group about potentially using uh, hacker room. So we're looking at doing our contest, developing everything remotely and then running it remotely via hacker room. Well, we'll talk about, I got a bunch of that stuff uh, in here later on. So we'll, we'll get to that and David can address what that might look like whenever we get to that point too. Okay, so basically what I try to do is I try to break my students up at the beginning of the year into groups. I have some of my advanced kids take four or five students and they start going over the very basic fundamental stuff. Because in order for you to go to the first few contests and be successful, you're probably, your rookie teams especially, are gonna have to know some things that you probably will not have already covered in class. Right, there's going to be things that they will not be ready for just because you haven't gotten to it yet. So that's where my advanced kids come in. 
they break a lot of those things down and they introduce those concepts to the students early enough so that they can get confident with them before they go to those first few contests. We go over printing, we go over loops, we go over strings, lists, matrices, everything to start out is on a real basic level. And then we're gonna come back, we're gonna spiral through these same concepts multiple times in our after school sessions just to make sure that we got everybody going. So what's that gonna look like this year? Probably gonna have to do some Zoom sessions. I'm gonna have to break up my group and say, okay, you guys are gonna take a group, you guys are gonna take a group. It'll probably start with me running a big session and then I'll run it, I'll run a session with everybody and I'll run a session with my advanced kids and kind of break them off into some groups and let them kind of lead some stuff. Does that make sense? Anybody got any questions about that so far? Okay, I'll get rocking and rolling and I'll kind of forget that you guys are here. So you have to have to make sure that you say, hey, I got, I got some questions or I'll, I'll just keep rolling. But anyway, and we'll talk about the PC squared thing in a minute. Okay. Uh, as we as we work through the groups, we'll do like a big session with me and then we'll break into smaller sessions, smaller groups with the advanced kids. And then we're going to get to the point where we go one on one. When we go one on one. I want an advanced kid with an intermediate kid or an advanced kid with a novice kid. And, and early in the year, we're going to start breaking stuff down like printf, regex, base conversion, nested loops, list matrices. You know, because if, if I'm going to go to competitions and I want my novice kids to do well and feel confident got to hammer some of these concepts home and get them to the point that they can start practicing with these as soon as possible. And some of this will string along for a while, you know, but if we don't, if we don't ingrain these concepts pretty quick, then they're going to go to competitions and get destroyed and they're not going to want to come back. And so we really want to get this on, get this up and running as quick as we can. And then from there, we're, we're going to kind of stage this out. I'll let me back up for just a second. So this, we're probably looking at, you know, a couple of weeks of this, we start breaking, <clears throat> excuse me, into a couple weeks of the one-on-one -on -one with the medium level stuff. And then we're going to go, you know, a couple weeks with the, uh, the algorithm. So maybe the first five or six weeks, we'll be doing a bunch of training and because that'll give us time before the first competition. First competitions are not usually until, you know, mid to late October, somewhere in there. <clears throat> Seven Lakes usually has their deal like uh, October 14th, 15th, somewhere in there. So it gives you a little bit of time. And there's other ones around the state too. Seven Lakes is just in the Houston area. Just kind of give you a, a, a point of reference. <clears throat> no, excuse me. Okay. Once we get through some of these things, now we're going into file input, mazes, graphs, permutations, DP, trees. Obviously my brand new students, this is not necessarily where they're going to be. My intermediate to pseudo advanced kids are going to be ready for this. My advanced kids should know all this, right? If they've done this for a couple of years, this should be, standard operating stuff. Now the DP and the trees, that's, that's a different story, but file input, mazes, permutations, graphs, that should be, that should be stuff that all my upper level kids can teach and feel confident with. The other part, obviously a little bit different story. If I'm in a small school and I'm Yoda and I don't have Obi-Wan to help me out, then obviously this process is going to have to be, I'm going to have to slow that down a little bit. And my, my time frame is going to be a little bit different with me being in a six day school, having been there for a long time with, with my system in place, I can plow through this a little quicker maybe than I could if I was just getting started. I was a new teacher to computer science. I didn't have a ton of kids in place already in my program built. So but these are the things you're going to have to get to at some point to get to that state level and feel like you're going to be in contention. Okay. So it may not be this year, might be down the road a little bit, but this is what you're shooting for, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? And you know, like I say, if, if not, you know, let, let's talk a little bit, but that's kind of that's where we're trying to go. And for programming, especially some of this ties into the written tests as well. And mainly what we're talking about right now is the programming side. But for the programming, these are the things that you're going to have to get to and spend a lot of time on to get your kids confident that they feel good about all this, okay? I threw a couple templates in here for you. And then I'll stop for a second and see if anybody's got any questions. But these are templates that you would use starting off with my novice kids. This is the template I'll have them start off with first, where they'll be looking at just basically printing stuff out. Because usually in, in, a, in the pro, on the programming side of things, in the programming packets, there's usually one to two problems that are nothing but print stuff out. Print out a box, print out the alphabet print out something where you don't need a bunch of loops, you don't need an array or an array list or a matrix, it's simple. 
So I want all my rookies going to the first contest to be able to do these problems. So if there's 12 and they don't get any right but the first two printouts, that's a success. We're going to put that on the announcements. We're going to 212. We're going to have a, you know, a cheering line, a drum section come through the building, and we're going to hoot and holler because they got the two printouts because that's, that's going to be an accomplishment just to start. So anyway, next stage up, we're going to start going through some loops. We're going to talk about how would you, how would you do this printout problem using loops, right? What would that look like? What, what, would be the, what would be a little bit different? How am I going to scale up from there? And then after the, you know, the first confidence builder with those printouts, now we're ready to start, start ramping it up a little bit more. And then from there, once we've done a bunch of training, we're past that six-week mark, they should know how to do file input. They should know how to set up a template where it has a main method. And I'll explain to you real quick why I do it this way. This is, might be information overload at this point, but you're going to have these slides in this video that you can look back at later. But these, I'm doing everything in the main. The problems that we're assuming we're doing at this point are basic, simple problems. Like one list, you know, simple array problem, nested loops, basic stuff. Here, when I start getting to this point, I'm assuming in my class, I'm probably going to maybe have to put in an instance variable or two and have something that I'm gonna to need to manipulate in the context of my class that's going to be a bigger concept than what I would normally do just in the main. Does, does that make sense? We're looking at bigger, more complicated problems, more like a maze. And in the maze, I'm gonna to have to manipulate some matrices and I'm gonna to have to pass some stuff around and the scope of my, my problem is gonna be great. But this template, not where you wanna start your new kids, right? You do not want to turn them loose on something like this they're just going to get blown away and want to quit, right? But if I start over here, this is simple enough that they can kind of get their feet wet and scale up. But over here, information overload. Anyway, we can come back to that if, uh, if we need to. Anyhow, in here, I've got just a basic file, uh, basic data file with a number at the top, stating the number of cases, and then a little bit of context to what that would look like. But your rookies, not where they're going to be until you get some of your training in place and kind of build up. But this is, this is where you're trying to go. Uh, practice problems. Once you get your basics in place, you want to have students pair up and work through old problems. All right, have them pair up, write the code on paper, work together, type it up, test it, and have your more confident kids work with your novice kids to kind of get these concepts ingrained. And you got to do this before the first competition. If you don't get a bunch of this stuff in place before the first competition, things can get a little tricky. Okay. How are we looking so far on the training side of things? Everybody's following me. Anybody have any questions, anything you want me to address? You can throw it in the chat before we move on and start talking about strategies. And if somebody got, a, if you have a question you want to ask, just throw your name in the chat. I'll, I'll say, hey, go for it. And then you can ask me live, whatever you want to ask. I've kind of steamrolled through some stuff real quick. So you may, may have something you need me to address. Everybody's good so far? Okay. All right. Let's talk about strategies. Uh, my strategies, these are things that I've done. You know, I kind of developed this after the first year or two of doing this. Like I said, David saw me in 2001, my first trip down to Austin, which was a lot of fun. Up until that point, I don't think I had any, any idea what I was doing. <laughs> so some of you may be in that boat right now. You're like, that's why I'm in this session. But I, you know, I kind of struggled with what my approach would be and how I was going to get teams ready and what I was going to do. And then over the course of time, I kind of started to build some steps in place and some strategies that I think work real well. Part of it is the training that we just went through, changing the way I was doing that instead of me doing it all, you know, teaching some kids and having them help me out so that we can get, we can get more work done in a, in a quicker amount of time. Once you get your, uh, once you get your concepts in place, now you need to start breaking into three person teams and you need to run some practice contests. And what a practice contest means, you have kids come in after school or online this year, you put together a pack of problems, either an old UIL pack or another pack or whatever it is. You put it in a system like PC squared or something of that nature, and you break them into teams and you run the contest just like it's a real contest. Okay, got a question from Tony. Hang on, let me, I'll slow down real quick. Uh, how many days a week do we practice? Typically one day a week for two hours. Typically on Thursday, we're in my room from three to five. Early in the year, if it looks like my novice students are just terrible, which sometimes they are, Let's be honest, sometimes they don't know what they're doing. Just like I said, I didn't know what I was doing when I was a novice coach. Sometimes we have to run two days a week because they're just really struggling and it's not, it's not getting where it needs to be. 
But once we, once we get through our training and everything looks good, we're doing one day a week on Thursdays for two hours. And we, we start to do these practice contests that I'm describing right now. That's what our two hours looks like. It's training up until the point that we feel like everybody's ready to go. Once, once everybody's ready to go, then we start breaking into practice contests. So what I do for the first few contests, and, and I essentially do this all year, but less and less as the year goes, I break them up into three-person teams. We run a PC squared or something like that contest in my room, or we'll do it over the internet via a different format. But I go around the room and uh, I look to see who's doing what. And if I see strategies that are bad, I start yelling at people, you know, throwing stuff, throwing a temper tantrum, whatever, whatever the case may be. But I need them to understand that, hey, we have a strategy that we use. We need to make sure that we got this in place. Here are the things and the steps that I need you to do for me in order for us to get this to work. And I'll go through some of those in just a second. And then once we do a bunch of these me coaching sessions, then we go into a more structured where they're working as groups and I'm doing less walking around the room and mentoring. Oh, yeah, good question. The, right now what we're talking about is, is just from the programming side on these strategies. When we're doing the training, Sometimes we mix in, mix in programming with some written. But for right now, what we're talking about mainly on the strategies is, is the programming side. But when we're doing the, the training sessions and the tutoring, when we're going over, say, uh, regex and some of those things, we're going we're gonna to hit those topics from a programming side as well as from a written test side. We'll, we'll tie some of that in as we go. Okay, good question. Uh, when we're, when we're breaking into these teams, okay, let me back up. We do the practice contest, then we're going to real practice contest, that kind of thing. When we start picking teams, don't let your kids pick the teams. It's a horrible idea. And most people will just put a list out. They let their kids sign up. They pick the teams. A very bad idea, right? You need to dictate that. And you need to be switching your teams up throughout the year. You say, well, I have one student, and I'm going to try to talk two other ones into joining the team. Well, then you might let them pick the team. Because <laughs> at that point, you're, you're recruiting. It's a different scenario. When I first started, I didn't have any teams. So in terms of picking the teams, that, that wasn't an option. But for me now, we'll carry throughout the year anywhere from 25 to 35 kids going to contests with me. We'll take 10 teams, maybe 12 teams sometimes. It, it'll cut down as the year goes on. But early in the year, we have a lot of kids. And so at that point, I'm mixing up the teams. I'm trying to mix and match and figure out what scenario works best. But for me, if you let them pick the teams, then they're gonna kind of say, here's, where I, here's, here's who I wanna work with all year. And in terms of you trying to mix and match, it gets complicated, okay? And so you're looking for the best group. You're trying to find the best pair. Because sometimes you might have three kids that are really, really strong that don't work, to well, don't work well together at all. I mean, they're just terrible. You put them together and one person hogs the computer, nothing gets done, and that's not necessarily the best combination. So you need to look at that as you go through the year so you can kind of see you know how this works how that works and no students bigger than the team you got to keep that in mind if you got a kid that really wants to try to call all the shots and say here's what we got to do and here's how we got to do it that's not going to work right and you, you got to really just keep an eye on that that happens in sports it happens in, a, in academics it's the same thing same concepts apply you know everybody's got to fight for the same goal push for the same goal which is the team goal and no one person should be you know, elevated above anybody else. All right, strategy wise, I make all my kids write everything on paper, everything on paper, right? The way the contest typically starts is there's three kids on a team. Uh, one kid starts on the computer. The other two are having to do some work. The other two that aren't on the computer writing everything on paper. The only time it's okay for somebody to get on the computer without code on paper is the kid that starts on the computer that's typically doing the two easy print, printout problems, right? So the two or three easy problems, you don't need to write those on paper but everything else needs to be written on paper. Before you get on the computer, you should have as close to perfect code on paper as possible, right? So if you're getting on the computer and you're just hacking around with no idea what you're doing, you're never winning anything, all right? It's just not gonna work. And if I practice this way, and this is the way we do the practice contest, then this becomes an ingrained concept. Even my best students, the strongest kids in my program, write everything on paper. And once we get this concept and this system in place, nobody ever grabs it back. And the reason being is they find out that they win a whole lot more if they do this, right? If they're writing the code on paper and they're testing it on paper, then they don't have any problems with, with getting on the computer and getting things to work. And you only have two hours, but if you do your two hours properly, you really have six hours because if each person has two hours and they're managing that time as a team and individually, 
you get a whole lot more done. If you're only working on the computer and all the only work that's getting done is the person sitting at the computer, you're burning four hours. And so that's one of those things. They're, most of these kids are pretty good at math. <laughs> well, this, most of them are, yeah, most of them are good at math. So if you break this down in terms of two hours plus two hours plus two hours, they ought to be able to get to six. And, and if so, they ought to realize that that's a, that's a better use of their time. Uh, rotate, PC, uh, rotate PC time. They got to share the computer. Best story I got on this in 2001, the team that I, I took to state that, that David remembers my first group. I had a girl on that team and there was a, there was a guy on that team that was a computer hog. He would never get off the computer. And the year before I cut him, he was the best kid in my program. I cut him the year before and he didn't make the top team because he wouldn't share the computer. And I told him, look, the reason that you don't, you're not on the team is nobody wants to work with you. You won't let anybody else do any work. So at the beginning of the year, the 2001 team, the young lady knocked him out of the chair. He wouldn't share the computer, so she hip bumped him out of his chair. He got up off the ground. He never once had a problem sharing the computer for the rest of the year. It was the funniest thing I've ever seen. That's the most physical any of my computer science teams have ever been. I've never seen any kind of physical contact ever in terms of like tackling people, but that was about as close as it got. But anyway, got to share the computer. If you don't share and you don't work as a team, there's no way all that code you've written on paper is ever going to get done. And so they'll figure this out as you go. But early in the year when I'm walking around the room and we're doing these non-official practice contests, this is probably one of the biggest things I have to talk to them about, right? One kid can't get on the computer and just sit there all day. It's not going to work. You're never going to get where you're trying to go. Okay. Okay. Uh, rotate PC time. Basically the way, way we do this, you write your code on paper, you get on the computer. If it doesn't work, you print it and you get out of the way. Right. And for a lot of kids are like, what do you mean? You don't sit there all day hacking on the computer, fixing your code. If you didn't write good enough code on paper, go fix it on paper, print it, go fix it on paper. Cause if you did your job writing it on paper, then you shouldn't have to spend 20 minutes on the computer fixing it. All right. And my top teams always are the best at this, right? It looks like at some point that nothing's getting done because they'll all be working on paper at some point. Some point as they get further in the contest, they got everything typed in. All they're trying to do is fix errors. There's no reason to be typing anything. There's not anybody, anybody even sitting at the computer. You know, sometimes that scares me. I look out and go, oh, I guess they just quit. <laughs> and then at the end of the day, they're like, no, you told us what to do. We did the strategy the right way. We just didn't need to be on the computer at that point. And so our goal is to print and work things out on paper. Now, in class, is this something that kids ever want to do? Does anybody have a student that would ever want to write anything on paper and print it and fix it? No, they're going to sit there and bang on the keyboard and hit their head on the monitor and just type random stuff over and over again until they get it to work. It doesn't work very well in a contest setting. And the other thing I think that's a amazing thing for them to learn is the teamwork side of things. I mean, they're really having to learn how to work as a team and they're learning how to talk to other people and how to negotiate. I mean, hip bumping somebody out of the chair, I guess that's the way to communicate, but there might've been a less aggressive way to do that. But you know, if I've communicated with you and you, it didn't work, then maybe, you got to find a different approach, but it does teach kids how to share time, how to work as a team, how to talk, all important skills. Uh, good teams print, you know, bad teams, they don't print. They just sit at the computer and hack. I can go to a contest at any point. I can walk around and I can tell you who's going to be in the top placing and who's not. Cause I can see the kids that are sitting there. One person's typing and the other two are watching that one kid type. You're not going to get very far like that. You say, well, I got a team of three. I had to recruit two kids and one kid's the only one that knows anything. Well, that strategy is going to be a little different, right? A little bit different. You can use what's called extreme programming at the end of the contest where you've got everything typed up. All you got to do is fix a couple bugs. You got one kid on the computer the last 10 minutes and the other two are trying to help fix one problem. That strategy works. But at the middle of the contest, beginning of the contest, if you only got one kid on the computer and everybody else is just sitting there watching, you're going to run out of time. Okay. All right. Let me see where we're at. Okay. I got this slide and then I'll, I'll take some questions. We're still looking pretty good on time. Uh, never debug on the computer. Print. Get off the computer. The only time you should be debugging is towards the end of the contest if you don't have anything left to type in. Right. And I'll tell my teams too, look, if the packet's really hard and you've got everything written on paper, or most everything written on paper and you're running out of time and you're not going to have time to fix what you've already typed in, then you might have to abandon typing in the rest of your code on paper and just try to fix what you've already entered. Right. Sometimes you got to adjust your strategy. In a contest like code wars where the problems are all insanely hard, 
you might not be able to write them all on paper and type them all in, and it might not be a perfect scenario. At the state meet for UIL, when the problems are much harder, you really might have to shoot for 10 problems rather than 12, or three problems rather than your normal six, or whatever, the, whatever your goal is, you know, you might have to adjust that based on the uh, difficulty level of the problems. Okay, uh, got a question. How many contests, how oh, many contests we attend don't allow printers? Well, hmm, that, that's a bit of a problem. You know, Code Wars does not allow printers. And so we have to adjust our strategy. So the way we adjust our strategy is your code on paper needs to be even better, right? And so if, if, I, if I can't type in my code that I've written on paper and print it and fix it on paper based on what I've printed, that means I'm going to have to fix on paper what I've written down originally. Does that make sense? And so if I can't print, for me anyway, with our teams, we feel like we're a man down if we can't print. Our printer is almost like a fourth person on our team. So if we're missing that fourth person, our strategy is totally, totally going to have to be worked around. Before code wars, because you can't print, we have to really practice. We have to do practice contests in a different way. It makes it harder. I think it makes it much harder. I think it's a. I don't think the contest is as. I don't think they're learning as much in that kind of environment. That's me personally. I, I think that's just adding complexity that, you know, doesn't need to be there. Uh, yeah, Jared. The question is when we say print. You mean writing on paper. When I say print, what I mean by that is the kids are going to write their code on paper originally. They're going to type it up, test it, see if it works. If it doesn't work, they're going to print where they were at after typing it in, and they're going to do work by tracing the code on paper uh, in the event that, that it doesn't work. And Alan mentioned split screens. When we go to Code Wars, we try to bring a widescreen monitor for that reason because that's one of our strategies for Code Wars is to try to split the screen and have one thing on the other side. Mm, total novice team, uh, best program to use when testing your code. If, if you're novice, what I mean by testing your code is you're gonna use an IDE, we use Eclipse. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write all of our code on paper. We're gonna have Java installed, we're gonna have Eclipse installed. We're gonna type up our code in Eclipse in a template that we were looking at earlier and then we're going to run that code and see if it works. And if it doesn't work at that point, we're going we're gonna to print it off. I think UIL, David can address this, but I don't, split screen is not a problem. As long as you only have one monitor, right, David? I can split the screen. That's correct. Yeah. And so it, Code Wars, once we asked if we could bring multiple monitors, we, we were shot down. UIL has always been one monitor, and UIL has always allowed printers since, since I've done this all the way back to late 90s. But, yeah. To me, the best IDE for competitions, because they're going to be local and you're going to be using a machine locally, is Eclipse. Obviously, if we're doing something online, most of your online systems like HackerRank or whatnot, are, they're online IDEs. You can obviously solve it off, offline and submit it, but they also have the ability to submit it through their system and debug it through their system too. For us, if we're using something like HackerRank, we typically solve them all in Eclipse and upload them. Right, we typically don't use their online IDE, but you could use that if you needed to. All right, practice-wise, uh, we talked about strategies. If 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 you're okay, writing code on paper. Well, you no. Know. So the question is, writing code on paper. Am I okay with pseudocode? And the answer is technically no. What I want them to do, I want them to write code on paper, and I want them to be able to type it in, hit compile, and it work. We're, we're shooting for. 100% success on the first compile. You say, is that possible? It's impossible. It, impossible. It is impossible at the beginning. It, it is possible as you go. You know, at the, towards the end of the year, uh, my strongest teams are able to do that. Doesn't work all the time, but I'd say 12 problems, four or five of them are perfect. Another four or five are, are one or two characters off. But if they're doing it with pseudocode, then the problem is they're going to have to convert all that pseudocode into Java and then debug. So they're going to be wasting a lot of time on the computer. Okay. If they're brand new and they're not real sure what to do and you got a kid that's just trying to sketch it out to help another kid that's going to have to type it in and fix it, that's okay. Uh, Eclipse, we use Eclipse in all of our classes. And so this year we're going to probably use Replit because we're going to be doing a lot of things remotely. And so Eclipse, Eclipse is going to work fine for my kids that are at home that can install stuff. 
but if they're in the lab and they can only work comfortably with the stuff that we install and have set up, then we're going to have to have another at home remote tool, which probably will be Replit. We do have, uh, let me see, Replit. It is R E P L dot I T. It's free for teachers right now, but it won't be forever. Uh, they're getting a whole lot more action in terms of people using their stuff and, you know, price is going to go up. But as far as Eclipse, you can get a portable version of Eclipse. We have a portable version of Eclipse at Woods that we use. So all of our kids can run it off a of USB. So they can go back and forth from home to school, do all their work on their USB, keep it all on their USB. So that's an option too. So anyway, this year we're going to have to have multiple tools just because of the way the, the learning environment is going to work. Uh, practice. This is individual and this is teams. Uh, they're going to have to master a lot of algorithms. Uh, they're going to have to know how to, you know, do nested loops, how to use an array, how to use a matrix, how to use an array list. And then from there, they're going to have to ramp up in terms of solving mazes, permutations, DP algorithms. This kind of stuff is going to be second semester later on. Obviously, you're going to try to introduce some of this early and kind of get the concepts moving. But a lot of this, it's going to take. Uh, DP stands for dynamic programming. And, and I would caution you. You can do some of the things with DP in other ways, save the dynamic programming to the very end and keep that mainly for your advanced kids. If you've got some really strong new kids that the advanced kids want to help, that'd be a good place to go. If you're Yoda and Obi-Wan, DP is probably something you need to delay, right? It's very complicated. It's cool, but it's extremely complicated. And you're only looking at maybe one problem a packet you'd ever need that for anyway but it's something that some of your kids are going to want to know how to do that, but it's down the road. I would spend more time solving mazes than I would worry about the DP stuff. At the end, I'll give you my email address and you can email me because some of this might, might not apply to everybody, but I'm happy to answer other questions and help you with anything you want when we get to that point. Uh, students have to work problem after problem after problem. I mean, that is the one thing I'll tell my students is there's the big quote that, um, Hard work always beats talent when talent isn't working hard. It's the truth, right? If I'm going to be successful with this, whether I'm a 1A school or a 6A school or a 3A school, I'm going to have to get the concepts in place. I'm going to have to train and teach the kids the concepts, and they're going to have to practice. Whether they practice in my room or they practice at home or they practice as a group, whatever it is, they're going to have to put in some work. There's no substitute for that. Uh, yeah, I, I have a couple things, Virginia, that I'll, I'll point out to you in just a minute. So don't worry, that's, that's in here. I, hey, what do you know? That's where we're going next, okay? So I'll, I'll show you a couple different things, but I can help you with mazes too, if, if you can't find me. Mazes are a different animal, but anyway. So practice, they're gonna practice as groups, they're gonna practice in your room, they need to practice at home. I've got a practice site where I've got a ton of problems in there. It's basically geared towards high school students. The way it's set up is to prepare for UIL contests, prepare for local contests, prepare for those kind of contests. It starts very easy with printout problems and works up to mazes. There are a couple other sites, Caddis being one that a lot of the colleges use. I'll open these up and show them to you in just a second. And there's USACO. USACO is where you're gonna use a lot of dynamic programming. Extremely complicated, not anywhere where you wanna start, but your upper level kids that need something to do that are driving you crazy, Caddis and USACO is the perfect place to send them. You won't see them for days. They'll go down the rabbit hole, they won't come back for a while, but they'll be extremely happy that you sent them. My site is designed to get you to that point, but it's gonna hold your hand. It's not going to, it's, it's not gonna destroy you if that makes sense. Okay, so let me, let me shift over real quick. Can you guys still see my screen? Okay, I turned off the screen sh uh, sharing real quick. Let me pull up a couple things and I'll go back to screen share. Okay. You should be able to see, can, David, can you see my screen now with uh, my practice site up? Not yet. Okay. I swear I hit share. Where did that go? All right, let me go. I got, I got off task. There we go. Okay, hang on. Okay, you got me now? Yeah, we got it. Okay. So anyway, here, here's the way my site's set up. And, and, you can email me and I'll give you a free account and you can try all this out, not a big deal. I, I set mine up where it starts like a UIL packet. It starts with printout problems. It works its way all the way up to advanced maze problems. You know, it's, it's pretty straightforward in how it works. I can walk you through how to do that. But this is designed for 
teams that have never done anything all the way up to advanced teams. There's dynamic programming in here, there's mazes, and it also starts off with very basic stuff. So as I'm starting the year training and I want these kids to work from home, I got a lot of stuff that we can go do this unit, this unit, this unit, and kind of work their way up. Over here, I've got Caddis. Let me make sure I got my chat up. No, we're good. Okay. Over here, we have Caddis. Caddis is uh, medium to advanced. It does have some little piddly problems like print out hello world, where it's just asking you to print out something real basic. But that's probably not where you want to start. I mean, it's going to be, obviously, if you're going to Caddis, you're probably going to be at a more advanced level than this already because that's probably not where, where you're trying to go to start. Okay, but anyway, you can go over here, they've got live competitions. You're, you're not gonna start here, but when you get to medium hard problems, this is where you wanna go. And then last but not least, USACO is extremely complicated. Problems are really hard, they have a training gateway. That would not be where I would wanna send anybody that hasn't done this for probably at least a year or two, right? If I'm dealing with brand new kids, I'm probably going to go to Caddis. I'm going to use something like this, like my practice site that's very basic, that's designed to scale up for kids that haven't done much of this, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. Now let me go back to where we just were. Okay. You guys are back with me? Okay. Just a couple places, and this will be in the slides and in the video so that you can kind of kind of see where, where we're at and what you could use if you needed it. Uh, practice contest. We do a bunch of stuff after school. Like I said earlier, we do clean packets where we're dealing with stuff the kids have never seen. We tie them and we run them just like a real contest. Early in the year, we're doing stuff using old problems and recycling them. Towards the end of the year, we want everything to be brand new, especially when we're going to contests and we haven't. We want it to be something that the kids have to work through that they haven't seen before. Let me see where I'm at. Okay, we're almost there. Uh, attend contest. You need to go to the UIL meets, the local meets, Invitational A, Invitational B, anything that anybody has in your area. Try to make sure that they have the written side, they got the programming side. You need to get in there and try to get both of those going as early as you can so that you've got some stuff that you can go back and review and discuss when you get back to school. So hey, Cody, we're, uh, we're still seeing your browser on the CADIS side. I don't know if you want to uh -oh. go back to. Sorry about that. Let me go back. I thought I reshared. Oh, hit the wrong button. How about now? Yeah, we got it. That, okay. So, yeah, sorry about that. I only missed one slide anyway, so we're good, David. Hey, thanks for letting me know. Okay, so once again, just to repeat, towards as you get towards the end of the year, you want to try to find clean stuff or at least old UIL packets or whatever that you haven't used. So what I try to do if I'm using the old UIL packs for practice, I try to start at a certain point and work my way up so that I finish all the O9s, go to the O10s, and try to work my way up from there so that I'm giving the kids something that we haven't already worked through after school in whatever manner it was. Like I say, go to all the local contests that you can go to. If you really want to excel on the programming on the hands-on side, you have to go to contest after contest after contest. If you just try to go to one, it doesn't work. But if you can find online places to practice too, that also helps. And then there's my contact, my contact information, and then I'll I'll open it up uh, if anybody's got any questions. Let me stop the share and I'll go back into the chat. Uh, if you, let's see what we got. Okay, yeah, you guys are seeing Caddis, we're good now. Uh, digital practice sites. If you go to the USACO site, it's got several books listed. Some of those books are really complicated. Uh, there's an algorithm design manual that's good. It's extremely complicated, it's almost all math. Uh, the problem with the books is that unless you're like a USACO level kid, the books that are available don't really do you any good. They're way too complicated. There isn't really a simple programming contest kind of book. What I tried to do with my practice site is kind of design it as a, a teaching site where it kind of scales you up. There's tutorials and stuff, but in terms of there being like a book, from the novice side, no. From the advanced side, you can email me. Here, let me put my email in there. You can email me and I can give you some links to some books. I think that's right. Yeah, that should be it. But you email me and I'm happy to follow up on anything. We still got like 15 minutes, but I'm happy to follow up on anything that you want me to follow up on. So now 
I'll just open it up into a Q&A format. If you want to shoot a question into the, uh, yeah, the, the competitive programmer's handbook is really good. But like you're saying, yeah, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty tough for most of those beginning kids. Uh, textbooks, I don't use any books. Uh, just don't find a textbook to be all that effective. You know, obviously you can disagree or whatever, but I've done this for 20 plus years. I've never ever used a textbook. I've just created my own stuff as I go. Simply because I like to have more freedom than a textbook allows. I like to be able to move units around more. And I find that kids don't read the book anyway. I mean, even my best kids, my most advanced kids, they don't read books. They go to websites, they'll read an article. I mean, if I can give, I used to give my kids stuff like the algorithm design manual. They'd all come back. The spine was never broken. A page was never turned. I spent 80 bucks on a set of books that for my contest kids, they never used. So don't use too much books. Definitely don't use a textbook, but there are some really good ones. You can email me. I'm happy to give you some suggestions. I don't want to endorse anybody on the uh, UIL, <laughs> UIL session. That wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, Blue Pelican book. Haven't looked at it in a long time. I know people have used those kind of for a contest contest guide, but it's, it's been, it's been a long time since I think it's been revised but I'm not 100% sure. I'm not familiar enough with that book to give you any kind of information. A good, good question. My advanced kids tutor my intermediate and novice kids to start, and then when we break up into uh, programming competition practice contest, that's when my advanced kids do most of their practice. And I also have an advanced computer science class at my school that most of my upper level kids are in and we do practice in there too. But most of those kids do a lot of stuff on their own. I've coached them up to a certain point, then they help me and a lot of them just go off and do USACO problems or CADIS problems. And they do, they do a lot of stuff on their own. There's a lot of competitions online that they do outside of what we do at school. Good question though. Anything else, what everybody's got, I'm here for, I'm here as long as you need me to be. I think, David, we got, what, 11 minutes? Yeah, yeah we've got about another about another 10 minutes or so. So uh, we'll okay. answer other questions if we have them. Yeah, perfect. I, I saved the last few minutes just so you guys could ask me questions because I'm sure there's stuff that I went through that you probably need me to clarify or quantify. And, and I'm happy to do that. Uh, Hacker Rank. Let me pull up the link for Hacker Rank, and I'll, I'll give you that link. Make sure I was spelling it correctly. Yeah, it's just HackerRank.com. I think that's right. Might be one R, but I think it's two R's. But that's how you basically spell it. In terms of a maze, what a maze is, a maze is a matrix problem where you have walls and you have pathways and you have a starting point. Yeah, there we go. You have a starting point and an end point in a maze and you're trying to see if there's a pathway to get from here to here, right? And there's places where you can walk and there's places where it's blocked. It's a recursive problem. If I'm brand new to this, that's where I'm trying to go eventually. If I'm at a school where I've already got kids that have been doing this for a while, I should have some kids in there that can solve one of those. Those are typically one of the harder problems in a UIL packet, typically one of the harder problems in like a code quest code wars packet, but something that you have to really know how to do. My son was our maze guy at woods. When he was there, he was the one that always, I taught him how to do it. And then he taught everybody else how to do it. And he was the one in all of our contests that always did those problems. Not, not where you'd want to start. Yeah, so w one of the things that I didn't mention that's part of the strategy that we use is uh, the first 10 minutes of the competition, we take the packet apart and we don't do anything other than look at the problems. So we spend 10 minutes going through the problems and we rank them easy, medium, and hard. And we figure out which ones are just array problems or matrix problems or loop problems or recursion problems. And we, we rank them, like I said, from easy, medium, and hard. And we make sure that we get the right person the right problem and we save the really hard problems and do those last. So, so if your strategy's bad and you don't spend 10 minutes looking at the problems and you start on the hardest problem first, 
you waste a ton of time and your two hours gets burned up on a problem that you never saw, if that makes sense. So the first couple minutes, that's when you have to identify whether it's a simple printout problem or it's a loop problem or it's a file input problem. That's when you're going to make those decisions. And if the training was correct through up to the point of the first contest, you hope that your students have done enough that they, they can identify the printout problem and the loop problem and, and all that stuff. Yeah, and David will make this available. I'm, I'm, you're like drinking from the fire hydrant right now, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm giving you 20 years worth of material in about an hour, but I'm happy to follow up at any point. Yeah, good question, Wendy. And the answer is yes. You'll have some students that are the nested loop gurus. You'll have some students that are matrix gurus. What you would like to have eventually is you'd like to have everybody on every team that can do everything but that's not realistic. Like I said, my son was the best at the mazes, but he wasn't very strong with dynamic programming. So he did all the mazes and another kid that was really good with dynamic programming would do all those. And so that's where you kind of want to balance out your teams. Like I said earlier, it's probably better that they don't pick the teams that you kind of go through and help them pick the teams. That way you don't have all the maze kids on one team and have all the nested loop kids on the team because then the nested loop team's not ever going to be able to do the maze teams. And it's just, you want to try to balance those teams out as best you can. And this takes time. Like I said, when I was first brand new at this, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. I, I mixed my teams up all the time wrong. I coached the kids the wrong stuff. I, we didn't print anything to start. It was a train wreck. And it took me several years to kind of sort it out and kind of figure out what I was doing. It takes time. Yeah, if, you, if you're brand new and you've got a brand new team, what I would do is I would concentrate on basically setting up a class with the main method and teaching them how to print stuff out. Just very basic printouts like we looked at to start. Make sure they can do the printout problems. Get their confidence up where they can do a couple of those in every packet and then have them start working with loops. So you'd start with my printout template, then you'd go to my loop template. Once they got confident with that, then you start bringing in something like some strings and some arrays and some matrices, but you're gonna to have to do that slow. If you're brand new and you've got a brand new new team, the last thing you wanna do is, is overload them too quickly. You want them to build their confidence up and really feel good about it. And it takes time uh, just to kind of help you, help you kind of get your, get your feet wet and get up to speed. And you'll get it going. Like I said, you can email me. I'm happy to answer all sorts of questions for you and help you through any of this. Me, I've been doing this for a million years, so it's a lot easier now than it was when I started, but I can definitely help you through the growing pains if you're having questions about how to get all this stuff up and running. Okay, what other questions do you guys have? We still got a few more minutes. Uh, I got four or five more minutes. We, we, I've handled several questions. What else you got? Uh, just a quick note, uh, Sandra mentioned uh, the We Teach CS program that John Owen works with. John is actually doing a session on that uh, program on Monday of next week on the 20th at 10 a.m. Uh, and he'll talk about how you can actually get your certification uh, through, through We Teach CS. So if you're interested in that, that's coming up next week. Yeah, good deal. I had a, a teacher at our school that, that worked with John some that also did some of that. So that's a good program. Uh, yeah, there is a comprehensive list of UIL uh, written problem types and everything. There's a, the first 15, I think, is posted. David can uh, address that, but I think that's posted on the computer science section of the UIL website. Yes, yeah, we have the, the complete topic list for the written test um, that, oh, that includes all the topics that may be covered and has the first 15 broken down specifically. It's still the 1920 list there now, but I don't anticipate any changes for, for 2021. Uh, the hands-on varies, Jared, from year to year. Uh, typically, you've got printout problems, you've got nested loop problems. Typically, some of your hardest problems are matrix problems and uh, dynamic programming problems. Those are usually two or three of the hardest problems. Uh, Chromebooks, Replit should work fine on Chromebooks. I have not tried a uh, Eclipse on a USB myself, but I'm pretty sure we had some students doing that. We load the JDK and Eclipse and everything on the USB, it's all portable. So it should work on any computer because the IDE is running off the USB. And I know Replit works on Chromebooks just fine. 
Uh, how and when do we bring in uh, written practice? When we're doing some of our training sessions early in the year, when we're going over uh, arrays and array list and nested loops, we do that from the programming contest side, but we also address that from the written side. So when we're going through those comp concepts, we make sure that the kids could apply those in a programming contest setting as well, be, as well as being familiar enough to do those in a, on a written test as well. Good question, Jerome. Um, yeah, hands-on topics vary, Jared, just to make sure I hit that for you uh, correctly. They, they vary from year to year and from packet to packet. But if you email me, I'll kind of give you an idea of what I think most packets typically have. It, it does vary, though. I can tell you what, when, when I create packets for A-plus computer science, what we try to put in packets each time we create those are general 12 standard problem types, which I think is what a lot of contests follow. All right. Any, anybody got anything else? Still got a couple minutes left. David, do you have anything that you need to address as we're kind of wrapping up? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I know the big question is, you know, what is the, the coming year going to look like? And uh, of course, things seem to be changing on a daily basis. Um, we're at this point, because our district, region and state contests are in the spring, um, you know, we're still certainly uh, hoping that we're going to be able to be back in our, you know, some, you know, our normal format, um, but we're going to continue to see what our schools are, are doing and are able to do. And we'll, you know, start evaluating options, looking at options, um, you know, if we have to go to an alternative format in the spring. But at this point, you know, we're, and we have to do that in the context, not just of computer science, but, you know, with other academic events as well. Um, so, I wish I had good answers. Uh, you know, I hope that we get a little bit of stability at some point uh, in the fall so we can kind of get a, get a handle on it. But, uh, but that's where we are. We certainly are uh, committed to having UIL competition and figuring out, you know, the most effective way to do that. And hopefully by the spring, we'll be in better position to uh, get a little bit back to normal. Do you have any other, other questions? Wendy, well, Wendy asked a question about Lambda. I answered that in the chat. You can email me. I can help you with that. I do have a review over Lambda that I can, I can help you with. Lambda is one of the more advanced topics for the, on the written side. All right. Well, I, I think that gets us uh, uh, to about an hour. But uh, thank you, everyone, for, for attending this afternoon. It's uh, been a great session. Stacy, thank you for presenting. Well, thank uh, we will you for be having posting, me, Dan. Uh, we will be posting videos. Uh, we, we don't have them up yet because uh, we've got a, a whole lot of video we're having to, to figure out where to store. Uh, but we will be posting videos of all of these sessions and uh, handouts and, and slides as well will be posted on that, uh, that website that I put in the, uh, the chat earlier and uh, it's on our, our Capital Conference webpage. So uh, thank you again to everyone for attending. Thank you, Stacy, uh, for presenting and uh, hope you all have a great afternoon. All right, thanks guys. Had a great time, take care.